in the insurance business, we all knew that COVID wasn't covered, but apparently none of our clients did. And that is sort of an indictment uh, mm-hmm. when you're talking about this disconnect, right, uh, of the agency uh, force because they didn't know. Is that right? Well, yeah, I, I think uh, I think that they didn't know, but they also, it goes to how insurance is sold uh, right now. All right, I'm Tony Caldwell, and welcome to another episode of The Uncaptive Agent, the future of insurance, specifically the future of insurance distribution and the insurance agency business. And I'm really excited today to have with me two outstanding guests, Susan Toussaint and Frank Panaccio with Oceanus Partners. They're down in Florida. And uh, while Susan is somebody I'm just getting to meet today, I've known Frank for a really long time. Frank is uh, a workers' compensation genius. Uh, I thought I knew workers' compensation 20 years ago and found out that, you know, I was like uh, Demosthenes stumbling around in the dark. And so uh, he helped me uh, learn a lot and really build a terrific program inside our agency for which I'll always be grateful. And uh, one of the things about Frank and, and Susan is that they are forward thinking people. They, they are changing the way insurance gets sold and distributed and they coach people and teach them how to do it. So I'm really excited to have you guys with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Tony. you very it's much, great to Tony. be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Pleasure yeah. to meet you. Nice to meet you. And so what we're talking about is where is the insurance agency industry headed? Um, you know, people have been worried uh, ever since I've been in the business that there wouldn't be an insurance agent in the future, right? We're all always going to be kicked out of the, out of the business by, by technology, by, by something. Uh, we're still here. Um, but people still do wonder, you know, what's it moving to? And the fact that we're having this amazing conversation today on Zoom means that geography isn't as relevant as it used to be. Technology is certainly uh, taking uh, over a lot of the business. So we're just exploring you know, where we think it's gonna go. And I'm really curious uh, what you all think the insurance agency looks like, say five years from now compared to today. I think we're gonna see increased pressure on uh, coming from insure techs, uh, especially, uh, whereby uh, the smaller accounts are being targeted. Uh, this business has been increasingly commoditized, literally billions and billions of dollars been spent in advertising every year uh, to talk about price and ease of use. Um, agencies are, are seeing literally billions of dollars now being invested in the insure tech space and in other automation uh, to take away their clients. About half of it is going into um, distribution, half of that money. The other half is going into underwriting and claims. Uh, the carriers are starting to align with insure tax. So uh, in addition, we, we've seen the, the business to, to consumer market. We've seen the business to business market. We have a whole new market evolving now, the business to business to consumer market with hmm. auto dealers coming in and auto manufacturers coming in, tests on the like. So uh, there's a lot of pressure. Uh, agents often say to Susan and I as we go around the country, well, what we sell is so complex and so difficult. We're not going to go the way of the travel agent or the mortgage broker. But when we really push back a little bit, we find that they're not providing a lot of value or insight to smaller accounts. You know, that's interesting. I read a, an article uh, just this week in the Insurance Journal. In fact, uh, the editor of the Insurance Journal's article this week is about that very point, quoting a couple of surveys showing, you know, a big disparity between what agents think and what their, what their clients think. I want to say it was like 95% of agents feel like they're creating value for their agents and about 70%, if I'm right, of the, their clients thought that. Um, and so that's exactly to your point. And that's not really getting any better, Tony. We're seeing a lot of um, surveys come back, a lot of research uh, saying that buyers, um, one of the reasons why retention rates are so high in our industry, somewhere between 87 and 92 percent, is because most buyers feel like nothing new is being presented to them, uh, that people are showing up. Uh, not necessarily understanding the unique risk to their business, not necessarily understanding the unique challenges within an industry, um, not even being sensitive to the role and organization of the people they're speaking to. And so um, there's a lot of um, 
opportunity, I would say, um, for uh, producers uh, and agencies to really re refocus their uh, sh uh, mindset uh, in terms of really understanding what buyers are looking for, because their perceptions is not necessarily the reality that uh, uh, business executives feel. Susan just said something really important that I always think about, which is opportunity. So if the house is on fire, you know, my view is let's run inside and pick everybody's pocket on the way out the door. Um, you know, so, so I want to come back to that though, but, but before I do that, Susan, I'm just curious, you know, um, we're having this huge issue right now with business interruption uh, coverage. And so what ends up happening is they follow the buyer's process and that process, uh, nowhere in that process um, are risk assessments being done. Nowhere in that process are buyers identifying uh, new emerging or escalating risks to their business. And so what ends up happening is uh, that, that copy and repeat, right? And so policies for uh, most businesses are at risk and don't know it. Their policies, um, they, the, the only blessing is that they haven't had to rely on their policies. You mentioned, you mentioned opportunity. So clearly that's an opportunity for somebody. And, and, and Frank, you brought up the fact that there's tremendous competition increasing, uh, more competition from insure techs and, and technology and, and people who are fueling uh, or fueling new businesses uh, pointed at insurance agencies' incomes based on that. So a lot of challenges. Where are the opportunities? Well, uh, Susan, I believe very strongly that the opportunities are doing what but basically Susan alluded to a moment ago, which we have to start engaging in conversations um, and, and talk about risks and, and, and talk about these issues that, uh, you know, that who would have thought that if I had a business interruption policy that I would be covered when there's a business interruption and, and insurance is exceedingly complex. The world is becoming in, incredibly complex and more hazardous. And, and this commoditized approach is just exceedingly flawed. So the, the pivot is to uh, start having conversations. We talk to agencies, uh, Tony, and they will share with us what percentage of their smaller accounts are renewed as is every single year. Mm. It's, it's striking. It's, and, and plus, the other piece of this thing we can't forget is there are now more millennials in the workforce than any other demographic. Now, they're not all in decision-making you know, positions yet. And no, there's no, this 58% of all businesses are owned by millennials. Uh, there you go. So and, and they just have a different buying style and a different buying approach. You know, there's a debate is, is the technology uh, driving the behavior or is the behavior of how I want things just now being enabled by emerging technology. Mm -hmm. And if, if that's the case, we're likely going to see, that uh, as millennials continue to make bigger and bigger decisions in the workforce, we're talking primarily commercial insurance today, but it applies to personal insurance as well. But in the commercial space, as millennials get into, you say they're over 50 odd percent already own companies, they get into more decision-making power. What's their buying process going to be? Uh, especially in the higher hazard, more complex, challenging accounts. And uh, I think that that's another big pressure we're seeing is this evolution of, of demands. And there's a couple of other demands, client demands that we'll probably talk about as we go through today as well. If we're not doing the job that needs to be done now, uncovering risk and, and tailoring uh, coverage to risk, uh, because we're just quoting it the way it is, you know, it seems to me that there's another, that technology actually exacerbates the threat there because, um, you know, Peter Diamandis, who wrote the book, Abundance, uh, The Future is Better Than You Think, and, and, and uh, is really a, a futurist as well as a, uh, as a serial entrepreneur, says that, you know, within just a few years, your AI, your artificial intelligence, will know everything you want to know. And so the figuring out for that millennial of, you know, not only do I need business interruption coverage, but exactly what does it cover and does it not cover is a simple question to his AI or her AI. And if the agent isn't, you know, doing a better job, they're going to be found out. Right? I would, I would agree. And I think the AI and in, in underwriting is, is virtually here. Uh, a a high-level uh, insurance carrier person, longtime friend of mine told me, Frank, we're getting very close to having just the name of the account put into a portal mm -hmm. and we'll be able to underwrite it and price it. 
just the name of the account. Yeah, well, firm, is that this account? Yes, that's it. And they'll be able to, uh, now that has nothing to do, Tony, with what you referenced with respect to, but are they going to get adequate coverage? So much of the insure tech is around efficiencies and bidding and, uh, and, and comparison shopping, but it, there's, uh, there's a big, big lift yet to get any kind of help with providing better coverage. And I think there, we have to also uh, caution, there's a difference between information, right, and advice. And, I, and we do believe that there's still an important role um, for agents uh, to provide advice. Uh, the information is everywhere, um, but what to do with that information and how to utilize it to make better, more informed decisions, that's where the agent role really comes into play. So what I'm hearing both of you say, I think, in, in one way or another is that the future opportunity for agents is relationships. Is that right? We would take it even one step further. We like, uh, who was it, Susan? We got to give attribution where attribution is, is due. Uh, that a relationship is an award for, for making a difference in someone's life. Um, you know, when I came into the business, Tony, my mentors used to say, go make relationships and make friends that people like to buy from their friends. Mm -hmm. Today, people don't have time to make new friends. They'll get a dog if that's what they need. What they need is, <laughs> is help in discovering adverse financial events that could change their life. And, and the way to build those relationships that you're referencing, and I think we're probably talking about the same thing, is to engage in a dialogue that will that'll raise awareness, pique curiosity about how they are likely at risk and don't know it, which we assert very strongly, Tony. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the vast majority of people out there are at risk unknowingly, because of what Susan referenced, the typical way insurance is, is bought and sold. So we're, we're looking to elevate the conversation and we have to also just entice people that are distracted, time starved and overwhelmed to come into that conversation because they push back. I'm too busy here. Just take my stuff. Everything's fine. Just take my stuff. Oh, you got some value added services. That's great. Tell me about them later. Just leave. What would you add to that, Susan? Yeah. And I think we have to define what a relationship is. Um, I think too much time is spent on the front end trying to build relational rapport uh, and trying to be liked um, by a business owner or a business executive. Where the real work comes in developing a relationship is helping them to discover that you're bringing something to the table that they're currently not getting. And as a result, they're at risk. They'll then reward you with that rapport. But there is a new demand, a new demonstration um, that is required for, uh, for producers uh, to get in the door, and Frank referenced it, is that you have to demonstrate that you are a subject matter expert, that you understand their industry, that you understand their business, that you are bringing insights that, they, that are absent uh, if they're not in a business relationship with you. That's the new rapport. That's the new currency, is to bring insight. Many successful agents have used target marketing, for example, to build books of business in the past. In fact, uh, that's how I met Frank, uh, was learning how to do that in a, in, a, in a better way a number of years ago. So that's not new to agents, but there's a twist here. Uh, and so I'm curious, so what role does technology have, I guess is the, is the place I'd like to explore for a minute, in helping agents with that deep knowledge, deep expertise, is it because they, they have time to develop that because they have a bigger geography that can operate in because of technology? Is it, is, it, uh, is it just that it's gonna be harder in the future and they just have to work harder? I mean, wh what do you think all that looks like? I think it's easier. I think there's never been a better time to be a producer, to be in sales in general. I mean, I think way, uh, way back in the way back machine when I first entered sales, um, I didn't have Google to uh, go and find out about my customer. I didn't have access to information that I could get at a snap of a finger to learn about an industry. Um, I couldn't connect the dots um, between who it is I'm already in a relationship with and whether or not they know one of my prospective clients like I can today on LinkedIn. So the, the information that we need to be successful, to learn, to build rapport, to develop insights, to gain that specialized knowledge is so much more readily available than it ever was in the past. It's the discipline to use it effectively uh -huh. and efficiently. 
I think is probably um, what is what's going to separate those that are successful and that those that are, are going to be more laggard. Okay. Frank, what do you think? Yeah, I think that technology uh, is going to provide uh, greater efficiencies for the lower level work that has to be done. I mean, I can remember the day I, I took Polaroid pictures of buildings. <laughs> no more. Uh, we're not going to need uh, vehicle identification numbers. If I get one number wrong, an underwriter kicks back things to me. Right. All of those lower level tasks are going to be automated or, or they're, or they're going to be outsourced, which allows everybody in the profession, not just the producers, but their account executives and support teams to elevate. I think we've got a misconception of what uh, business process automation is going to look like. That it's just going to be one robot that's going to spit out certificates and, and buying policy. No, there's going to be a lot of different robots. They're going to be managed by people. But if we can automate the lower level stuff, that will allow folks to do that higher level work that is in much demand and is underserved. Tony, I make the following assertion and nobody's convinced me otherwise yet. There's not a single building in the country that's properly insured. Not wow. one. Not one. And then people go, well, wait, what do you mean? And we start to drill down into that. And of course, one of the advantages Susan and I have in working with agents all across the country is um, when things go bad, we hear about it. Right. They call us for help. And uh, so we hear those tough stories of what happens when uh, I just had a hundred year old building burn up. I've got a $3 million building ordinance issue. The carrier gave me $10,000 worth of coverage and I didn't add additional. Yeah. And we could go on and on, which we won't today. That's a <laughs> for, we won't go into those weeds today, but um, it, it's, it's the benefit and the opportunity. And the challenge is engaging people in conversations about how they are likely at risk and don't know it. And then leading them through an ongoing process because insurance and risk management also gets treated like an event, not an event. It's an ongoing process that never ends. Well, if you're right that no building in America is properly insured, I mean, then Susan is right, which is that the time has never been better to be an agent, right? <laughs> right. I mean, because there's huge opportunities. But let me ask you this is, you know, agents work in agencies. And, uh, you know, in the past, agencies have had, you know, some structural issues like, okay, you've got to be a certain size, you can represent a certain number of carriers, so you have the right kind of volume, and you can have the relationship and all those things to be, you know, to be effective at having a product to sell to, to, the, to the client. Uh, and so uh, larger agencies, particularly in commercial insurance, have always had a lot of advantages uh, compared to smaller agents. But who wins in five years? Is it the uh, in commercial insurance? Is it the big agency or is it the small entrepreneurial agent, maybe in a smaller shop? The, the big are getting bigger and are making demands of carriers. And, and uh, we have agencies now that are bigger than the carriers they represent with respect to revenue. Um, and they've got a lot of leverage. Now, uh, all this is happening in a low interest rate environment. A lot of it's, you know, heavily leveraged debt. We'll see, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm not predicting insurance, uh, interest rates are going up. Um, there will be, you know, those little, little, those niche players, those boutique shops. But by and large, we heard from a very reliable source, uh, Tony, I didn't have any way of vetting it, but from a very reliable source about a year ago that there were only 2,500 agencies left that are independent with more than $3 million in revenue. Wow. $3 million in revenue. Yeah. And they were, they've been, other than prior to COVID, they were being picked off five to 700 a year. Right. So we see bigger for the foreseeable future, a lot of leverage. We hear carrier people sharing with us that it's changed the relationship, this size. They could, they could come to you, Tony, and say, I give you 50 million in premium in the next three months. But here's what I want. Right. right. And, uh, you know, will there always be niche boutique players out there? Yes. The one thing that's different for the niche boutique players today that uh, I didn't have the advantage of when I hung out my shingle with no clients for the first time was um, with these uh, uh, clusters. And I know they don't sometimes I don't like to be called clusters, but I could join a group and get access to just about anybody overnight where that didn't exist 25, 30 years ago. So the small right. boutique players can get access to carriers which access to carriers is now 
you know, of no real value. Everybody's got access to everybody pretty much with, with very, very few exceptions. Yeah, and I think I might answer it a little bit differently. I think that there's going to be room in the marketplace for both. Um, I think the big are going to get bigger, but let's let's talk about the challenges that they're facing. They're acquiring at an enormous rate. Uh, they don't always know what it is they're acquiring until they get them. Um, they're acquiring agencies that maybe haven't grown organically. Uh, they're acquiring agency principals who are looking for an out pretty quickly and don't necessarily have a perpetuation plan that's uh, tight, uh, and that's why they sold. Um, and they have acquired all agencies that have different processes for uh, client experience models, uh, different technology. And so they've got to sort through all of that. So at some point, there's going to be a reckoning. Are, are they going to be able to take all of these acquired entities and help them row in the same direction, provide a strong client experience and grow organically where they couldn't independently? Those boutique agencies, they have it a little bit easier if they uh, are spinoff uh, from an account uh, from an agency um, uh, and they start up again, they have that experience uh, and they have the ability perhaps to grow pretty quickly um, and maybe move into a lifestyle agency versus a big, big aggregator. Well, you know, if you, if you, if you think about the points both of you are making, so Frank on the one hand is making the point that, you know, Hey, market access is no big deal. So you can get the carrier. Uh, and, and Susan, you're really talking about the things they offer isn't that big a deal because what really matters is this conversation with the client or the prospective client that it's really about talent, not about size or carrier access, right? If that's the real future, then it seems to me that there's opportunity regardless of the agency size you're in. Maybe, maybe agency size matters less than it ever did before. What do you think of that idea? Case can be made, especially uh, to to combine with what you just said, Tony, with a specialization, mm -hmm. whether it be an industry or a product specialization or a combination of the two, uh, that, uh, look, we know some very successful smaller agents and agencies. They're very, very good at what they do. Uh, they can compete with the biggest and the best. And uh, so I, I, I think it could go both ways, that, that what we're seeing with the aggregation is, as Susan mentioned, I think the vast majority of agencies were not growing and, and mm -hmm. they didn't have a perpetuation plan. And, and if the kids didn't want to come into the agency, uh, the, the top producers really didn't have the money or the interest in buying it. And, and uh, the aggregators came in. So uh, there's a lot of different things moving around in the industry right now, but I think someone could, could succeed in both places uh, and be as happy as they want to be. Uh, either in a small agency as a niche player primarily, and, and there's a high demand for the high hazard complex account getting the best advice to go back to something that Susan said earlier. There is a paucity of that. It is lacking. And if someone steps up to fill that role from a big shop or a smaller shop, the marketplace is going to reward them. Again, back to this whole idea of targeted marketing, subject matter expertise, uh, niche uh, niche marketing with people that you really understand the, the needs of better. The, the traditional limitation of an agent, whether it was a small shop or a big shop, was you operated in a geography. You were in a town or a city or you're in a state. Maybe you went next door to the next state. But very few uh, agents have ever really been successful at building a regional or even a nationwide practice. It seems to me that this uh, amazing uh, thing we're doing today, this Zoom call that we're on, and a coach of mine, Dan Sullivan, says Zoom is not a communications technology. It's a, it's a transportation technology because I can transport myself from here to Florida or you're in Oklahoma, right? A smart agent that's got great skills and great knowledge in a niche can niche deeply but market broadly today in a way you could never do before. So do you see that as something agents have recognized, begun to take advantage of, or is that still out there in the future? I think, look, I think there's a camp out there that says, I'm just going to hunker down until this thing's over, and I can't wait to get back out in front of people. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to tolerate this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work my way through it, but I have no intention of using this beyond uh, a, a therapeutic coming out or a vaccine and, or right. herd immunity. Whatever it takes, I'm going to get back out in front. There are others that are seeing this as a big opportunity. Now, we would assert, uh, Tony, that 
you you mentioned skills. You've got to be a lot better doing it like this because we're giving up a lot. You know, we we you can see the top half of my body. You can't see my whole body. That gives up a lot of communication. There's challenges to be overcome. What uh, it's it's it they can be overcome with better skills. The skills that got you to success face to face are not. You got to amp them up in order to do it via Zoom. Um, what would you add to that, Susan? Yeah, I think um, just two really quick stories that are related. Um, one is I think that um, if you're in a demographic uh, environment where you have the ability to specialize uh, within your local area, it makes it much easier to spread. If you're in, uh, you know, North Dakota, it's hard to be a specialist in something uh, that, uh, A, you don't have enough of it to get the muscle memory to understand the challenges enough that you can, you can expand. So geography uh, matters uh, in terms of specialization, and those that live in more condensed environments have the ability uh, to, to, to gain that specialization locally and then expand it nationally. With regards to where we are now uh, within the pandemic, uh, working with a young producer um, who has to drive uh, fairly far uh, to um, meet his revenue targets, um, this pandemic has actually been a great thing for him in that he uh, identified, you know what, I'm pretty good at running my first meeting um, over Zoom. I'm going to continue to run my first meetings over Zoom. And if that person then qualifies, then I will move to an in-person meeting, um, either for my second meeting, although now he just reported to me, I'm doing more and more risk assessments um, in, uh, on, over Zoom. So I think that what's happened is that people are people that are naturally aggressive, naturally interested in excelling and exceeding and, and doing well, will utilize this time um, and, and take advantage of it. They're not wasting the crisis. They're making the crisis work for them. Well, you know what, that's back to the point you made earlier, which is that talent really trumps everything. But I, I would argue this, you know, with Zoom. So if you think about Zoom as being a transportation technology, just to stay with Dan Sullivan's comment for a minute, um, you know, think back to the first part of the 20th century when automobiles were first invented. Now, they didn't call them automobiles or cars or anything like that. They called them, uh, what they call them? Horseless carriages. Horseless carriages, carriages right. <laughs> and, yeah, and they did that because, and same thing with movies, right? You didn't have movies, you had talking pictures. Right. And I think that's interesting because, um, you know, people tried to describe this new reality using an old lexicon, right? because they didn't understand even then what it was capable of doing. So you're driving this horse's carriage, not understanding that you're going to go 100 miles an hour across the country in two days on a, on a super highway in a generation. Uh, and having had some experience with uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, things like that, uh, you know, I wonder how, well, let me say this, you know, you couldn't use Zoom a year ago. I mean, I've been a Zoom subscriber for four or five years, but there wasn't anybody to talk to. It's like having a phone, but you're the only guy in the county that's got one, right? <laughs> but, but now everybody's got it. So augmented reality would be the same way, right? Uh, you know, a few, a few uh, you know, geeky people. I've got a computer in the back office back there with a headset, and I go in there, and I'm constantly dragging the computer off the desk because I forget I've got a six-foot <laughs> But, but I won't have that soon, right? Soon it'll be like, you know, a pair of glasses. And so when that happens, and then you've got that pair of glasses, and we have this, uh, you know, so it'd just be interesting to see how that, to, to, to your point, Frank, about, you know, using the whole body for communication, when you get that back, when, when video communication, in other words, is not just two-dimensional. Right. Uh, and that's likely to happen in this, four or five year period of time we're talking about. But Susan, I think what I'm hearing you say is the aggressive, ambitious, talented, driven individuals are gonna latch on to whatever that is to find a unique edge to be successful, regardless of who they work for and how big the organization is, is that right? I do, I really think that that's the case and we see that happening. We, uh, we even see it with the folks that we're coaching. There are those that um, said, 
okay, so now I need to move my meetings to Zoom. I'm comfortable doing that. I'll role play it a couple of times and I'll, I'll lead my buyer and my prospects to that. Um, there are others, like Frank said, that have hunkered down and said, oh, geez, I'm really not comfortable. We have to get comfortable being uncomfortable because change is inevitable and the rate of change is only increasing. And so we have to get comfortable with whatever, whatever new technology has come our way. If we had our druthers, we would only train in person. We love that interaction. We like the sidebar conversations. We like uh, being able to stop, go off script, and engage. You can do that to a certain degree uh, with Zoom and other technology platforms. Um, but at there, there's going to come a point where perhaps this is the way we train, and then we move into that virtual reality. And, and Frank, you've got your own thoughts around the future of training. Well, I, I think there's a lot of things happening uh, in the workplace right now. There's virtual uh, reality being used to uh, put people in, in the situation. They're going to be able to build a cell phone tower. They go through it virtually before, and then they go through it virtually in the dark. I mean, it's, it's, we're already seeing that kind of application. Um, the, the, the thing that we're hearing from our clients right now, Tony, with respect to training is the content comes through virtually. The informal learning that happens over dinners and lunches and breakfasts and adult beverages or, or other types of beverages, um, that's missing. That the informal conversation, you and I are having dinner and I say, Tony, how do you handle such and such? Right. That, that's the, now, will people spend the money for an airplane ticket two nights in a hotel to get informal learning, to go with the, maybe the 95% of the content that's coming through without leaving your family for a couple of nights and expending the time and energy and right now taking a risk. I don't know that we have the answer to that just yet. Well, you know, I think this is really interesting uh, because my observation is that really successful people, uh, people who are, um, you know, extraordinary, uh, are people who are always trying to get better and who invest a lot of money in themselves for training. And, and then you have the people who, you know, are, are kind of happy. They don't, they don't care about growth, right? And, and they never do that. And there's really two types of people. But I think the thing that you're talking about, Frank, I'd almost call that something else. I think that of that is coaching. You know, a coach is a teacher, right? I'm going to teach you a system. But the coach is also that person that's a great observer and a great relater with people. But coaching is probably been taken place, but it hasn't been talked about. But I'm seeing it being talked about more and more all the time. What, what are you saying? Well, we know that the clients that work with us with our coaching program post-training have the greatest success because behavior change is hard. And it needs to be reinforced. And in training, there is a forgetting curve. There's a certain amount of, of forgetting that happens over time. But when, when those, those principles and those strategies and those ideas and those tactics can be reinforced in real time with real clients uh, or prospective clients until that becomes the default behavior, because that's the biggest thing that we see. Because what we teach agents is, is pretty significantly different than what's in the marketplace by and large, Tony. Um, we, don't, we don't try to persuade people with evidence and reason. We, we, we use the neuroscience around emotion and, and, and things like that. And, and we, I, we're not gonna get into the weeds on that, but that needs to be reinforced because if it's not reinforced and mentors back at the, at the agency, if they're not trained, they're just gonna say, oh, forget that. Here's how I did it over the last 30 years. Just do what I say. And, you'll be fine. And, uh, you know, by the way, put away your white belt. It's after uh, Labor Day. You know, I think that I think you're 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 dead on, Tony, in that the coaching is what um, and, and Frank, the coaching is what creates the change behavior. Um, training is information. It's insight. It, it's experience that's being relayed. What coaching does is it makes it applicable to the person who's trying to utilize it um, through real live experience you're going into a first meeting, here's what we trained you to do, let's talk about it. Let's talk about how you're gonna execute on it or let's debrief and, and talk about how we can get better the next time or how you might have to go back and start over again in a certain area. So the coaching is, you know, training without coaching um, 
is is uh, you know I hate to say this it's it's um it's a challenge I think it's it's a challenge producers need that um, that hand holding anybody who's trying to adopt a new behavior or to try to do something differently very mm -hmm. few people can sit in a classroom for two days absorb it and then execute it um, and uh, I think that the coaching is critical and mentoring. And, and, and what's the difference in your view between coaching and mentoring? You know, mentoring to me is, is really more about the, the big picture, the big philosophy of, of, of where you are, where you could be, um, some of the big steps that you need to take. The coaching is really that let's walk through it. Let's have it happen. Uh, let's, let's, let me help you engage in new behaviors. You know, when we talk about mentoring, it's what do you aspire to be? Mm. Where do you want to be? Coaching is how are we going to get you there? And what are the steps that you need to take? I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great, it's, it's as well defined as anything I've ever heard. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing that. You know, here's what I'm kind of getting out of our conversation today, which is a lot of enthusiasm and excitement about the future and belief that the agency and the agent has a big future, but that it's different than today. It's more demanding mm -hmm. from a technical point of view and a relationship point of view, because as Susan really points out, relationships uh, are going to be maybe in a sense more real uh, because they're based on things that really matter to the prospect in the future. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter whether you work for a big agency or a small agency, it's about the talent. Mm -hmm. And what technology does is make the job, the, the, the grunt work, the grit work, I think is, as Frank pointed, it makes it easier so that you can focus on those things that do really matter. And that uh, to make that transition and to maximize potential requires uh, training, coaching, and mentoring. I mean, if I could wrap it all up in a bow, that's kind of what I'm hearing from you guys. What, what am I missing? I think the only thing we would add, and, it, and it, it ties in, it's not missing, it's just, it deserves mention. And that is that uh, larger, more complex accounts are demanding more data. Insurance producers tend to not have an acumen for math. So it's a big lift to have an agent producer get comfortable. And we're not going to ask them to become actuaries, but they got to be able to tell the data story. They have to be able to work with actuaries because as you move upstream, the demand of CFOs, which by the way, they're being uh, challenged with robotic process automation where a lot of their work with general ledgers and financial statements is going to be robotic. So they're being told, read their journals. They're being told, you better become far more data analytically inclined. We're not going to need you. We're not going to need 80% of you. So uh, so one thing that we're, we're seeing a big challenge for agents and agencies is how do they bring more data to the table that is being demanded by the CFOs that's actionable around what's the loss projection? What retention should I be using? Is the collateral correct? Should I even be on a loss sensitive plan? Are my losses developing better or worse than like or similar? And on and on uh, as, as we, we, we do some training around this. And one of our favorite quotes is by uh, Dr. Deming, Dr. Edward Deming, who said, you know, if you don't bring data, you're just another person with an opinion. <laughs> and, and that's, that's a, it's hard for agents that are just not analytically inclined. Susan, would you add anything to that? Uh, I wouldn't add anything to the data, but um, to your point, Tony, um, around the skills um, that uh, agents are going to need to bring to the table, there's a skill that I don't know if it can be taught or not, that I think the most successful agents, most successful people have, and that's curiosity. They're naturally curious. I don't know, but I want to know. I don't know where, but I'm going to find out. I don't know how, but I'm going to learn. You know, when people ask, how do I build a million dollar book of business? How do I build a $2 million book of business? It, yes, there's a process. There's a sales process. There's a, there's a client acquisition strategy. There's technical knowledge that you need to have, but you have to be curious about getting better. You have to be curious about um, what the future is going to look like for yourself and for your clients. And without that curiosity, um, boy, it's going to be really hard. Well, it sounds like um, the, the elements are there for the agent to have a role into the future and to be successful into the future. But 
that on balance, it's more demanding. Mm -hmm. Right. Let me ask you this. So if somebody's listening today going, crap, I don't know if I want to do all this. This sounds like hard work. <laughs> I've got a friend who's a, a vice president uh, for, a, a, you know, a big national insurance company. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's on the carrier side, obviously. And we were at a cocktail party and he, he said, you know, when I retire, I'm going to become an independent agent. And there's like a, there should be a little drum beat in there because it, you know, you get the joke and you start laughing, right? I mean, you know, he thinks we're lazy. Right. And, uh, and the truth is you could in the past, you could work really hard for three to five years and build a lifetime of high income, right? And be retired in place. What I really kind of am picking up from your opinions is that that's no longer possible. Uh, that to, to really be successful in this business, you've got to commit to being a professional and working hard to get better every day for the rest of your career. Is that a fair statement? I, I think it's fair for a number of reasons. Uh, first, tell me an industry whereby there was great inefficiencies and it's still operating the way it used to. Mortgage brokers, full service stock brokers, travel agents, poof, poof, poof. Now they're still around. Travel agents are now called outfitters. They're very, they're, they're doing something very specialized. They're not selling a hotel room booking or an airplane ticket anymore. So there's a, a tremendous, uh, just with the, with the microprocessor, with data storage being practically free, with quantum computing right around the corner and already the computers are blazingly fast because who would have thought that, uh, you know, the Intel guy was uh, going to be correct that computer processing speed would double every two years and it has for the last 50. And now it's going to go a quantum leap ahead of that. So all of that is driving out the inefficiencies. Why have two point some billion dollars a year for the past three or four years been invested in this industry? Because private equity and other investors see residual income, which, which carry great multiples. They see people not doing much. And they're seeing people not doing much with a lot of overhead. Mm. We could do nothing cheaper. <laughs> we can we can be far more efficient. If you're going to do nothing, we'll do nothing. Right. But we'll do nothing with machines. But the opportunity just has pivoted to a place where it should have been all along, Tony. Tony, when I first came in this business, uh, it was also what what plaques you had up on the wall. You know what what carriers did you represent? Well, that's gone a long time ago, and we just continue to see a push towards the real purpose of the business is, is that uh, the irony of this business is you may not know how good you are for five or 10 or 15 years. Uh, living in Florida, we always had hurricanes. You had to button things up for the hurricanes, but their adverse financial events are infrequent, but when they occur, they're life changing. And mm -hmm. the likelihood is unless we elevate the profession, which now the pandemic, more technology, all of these things we've talked about, don't need to repeat them all, are providing an opportunity to elevate. And uh, I think that it's much needed. It is much needed and will be uh, continue to be handsomely rewarded. Well, those who, who do elevate, though, I think they do, uh, they have an opportunity for much, much bigger rewards. We, we helped an agency start about five years ago. They, they sold April 1st for 15 times EBITDA. They built the agency with that in mind. They went out and did exactly all the things that we've been talking about for the last 30 or 40 minutes. They did all those things and they got an enormous reward for it. You tell people six times revenue, they just can't even believe it. But that could be the norm for the future for the people who do what you're prescribing. So I just want to put that out there as, look, this isn't all drudgery, right? Because with six times EBITDA or six times revenue and 15 times EBITDA, you can have a really, really nice life uh, and do anything you want to do. So Absolutely. it's still a wonderful business. Absolutely. Well, and Frank, I think you would say that uh, one of the best rewards of this business is you get to pick your customers. You get to choose who you want to do business with. This isn't retail where everybody walks in off the street. Right. <laughs> That's the other thing, Tony. There's so many ways to make money and make a life a lifestyle in this business. I've told Susan many times, if you ever see me open a retail establishment where anybody can walk in and I would have to serve them, get the coat that ties in the back and then take me away because that is especially as I got later and later in my career, got more and more selective. Just, uh, you know, I felt like I should, I should write a check to my clients for providing me such insight and, 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 and wisdom and friendship. And uh, this profession allows that. It allows us to choose who do we want to spend our day with. 
And uh, there's some incredible people out there that you get an opportunity to spend your day with and get paid to do that. So um, yeah, that's a big difference. That's a, it's a profession unlike many. No, it certainly is. Well, I really appreciate you all taking some time out of your day to, to share your wisdom and insight. I mean, I know you're working with highly successful agents every day, uh, people who are building something for the future. And so I really appreciate it. You know, any last thought before we get off our call today? I think, you know, my last, my last thought is um, this is a serious business. Yeah. And I know Susan knows I'm going to the movie quote for serious people. <laughs> And, 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 and that we have a far greater uh, responsibility than a lot of people think about. I'm, I'm hoping that one of the silver linings in this very, very tragic dark cloud of the pandemic is it does become a watershed event where people can, we can now ask people, did you even have the opportunity to buy pandemic insurance? It wasn't available, but with the conversation even allowed it because without that conversation that would have even allowed a choice you, you can't have the conversation around uh, making sure you have adequate and, adic and, and, and accurate insurance. We are going to have a significant power grid disruption at some point. Who's insured for that, Tony? We all know what's going to happen. And let's start paying attention to people that are outside our industry. Bill Gates told us five years ago this was going to happen. I didn't pay close enough attention. It was out there in 2015 on TED Talk. Zurich and Marsh have been doing heat maps for the last 15 years it barely showed up as a blip. So we, we have to take what we do extremely seriously, look out across the horizon. There are things we can't insure. Pandemics are not insurable. Doesn't work for the industry. We have 800 billion in surplus. It was a trillion dollars a month in lost business income. Not gonna work without a federal backstop. But there are a lot of things we can insure that are not being talked about, or they're not being talked about enough, or there's not the guts and gumption and talent to step in and say, push that paper back across your desk or hold on to that PDF that's been zipped up. Don't send it to me yet. Let's talk. It is likely you're facing adverse financial events that could change your life for generations to come. It's likely. Let's talk. And that's the, hopefully there's a silver lining in the pandemic that will help people just start to think differently about this entire profession and the industry. That's great. Thank, thank you. Susan, any last thoughts? Yeah, you know, as, as I was listening to Frank and, and thinking about something that you said, this can be an incredibly rewarding career, um, but it also requires um, a lot of responsibility. Um, you're, you're entering into a business relationship as a professional, and um, you have to believe that businesses are at risk and they don't know it. And you owe it to them to search and to look and to help them discover those risks and to help address those risks. And don't take the easy way out. Don't, don't copy what somebody else did uh, and assume it's correct. Um, you owe your customer that and you'll have a far more rewarding career as a result. So um, risk and reward, I think, um, I think it's a great industry and I think it's a great business. And I think uh, the folks that take it seriously are gonna continue to be successful regardless of uh, the direction of, of a large agency or a small agency. Well, hey, Susan and Frank, thank you both so much. Uh, Oceanus Partners, you guys uh, teach, train, mentor, develop, and coach people in how to do these things. Anybody out there that would like to learn how to be a better professional, be more successful, uh, I'm a believer in you guys, and uh, I would encourage folks to reach out to you. So again, thank you for being with me. Thank, thank you, you so much, Tony. Tony. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. We enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm talking to independent agency owners about this all the time. If you'd like to have a more personalized conversation, click on the button or the link in the description and we'll make that happen. You can also reach out to me at tonycaldwell.net slash contact.